Hello, I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Hold the Hope. This is our weekly message, and our message today is entitled, Finding Hope in a Hopeless World, Part 1, The Problem. We, we're going to take our scripture today from Luke chapter 24, verse 13 through 35. Last week, we celebrated um, Resurrection Sunday. We, we celebrated the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The empty tomb is the very, it, it, it is the epitome, is the symbol of hope. But it's easy to take our eyes off of the empty tomb and put them on the world that is filled with gloom and dread and hopelessness. There's so much hate and division in our world. There's so much lying and stealing and cheating. There's fear mongering and deceit. All ravish the world that we live in today. COVID-19 is the center stage. First, it was too dangerous. A mask wouldn't help. Then you couldn't go out without a mask. Now, only double masking and a vaccine will help. The vaccine is our only hope for a normal post-COVID life. Only, it may not even prevent you from getting the virus. You still need to wear a mask. You still need to social distance. Fear of the day. Fear of the night. Rising prices, lower wages. Seems like every day the, the price of gasoline is rising. In with the new, out with the old causes people to lose hope. Well, Cleopas and his friend found themselves in this same position. They had lost hope, as did the other followers of Christ uh, on, on that weekend that Jesus was crucified. They had lost hope. Their hope died with the Lord. Turn with me to Luke chapter 24, and we're going to read a pretty lengthy uh, portion of scripture here. We're going to read the whole account, 13 through 35. So Luke chapter 24, verse 13 through 35, and it's the account of the two men on the road to Emmaus. It says, That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What is this conversation that you're holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there these, in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But... We had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all of this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets had spoken. Was it not necessary that the, the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were, they were going. He acted as if he was going farther. 
But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is towards evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their, eye, from their sight. They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. The scripture starts out that very day. But what very day? The very first Easter, Resurrection Sunday. Jesus was crucified. Jesus died and was buried. And not a whole lot of people knew that he was, he was resurrected. Everybody knew he was dead. But nobody realized that he had risen, even though he had told them that he would rise again. Even though he said, uh, I told them the sign of Jonah. Three days, as Jonah was three days in, in the belly of the great fish, so shall the Son of Man be three days in the belly of the earth. Still no one understood. No one realized. No one knew. Imagine the sen sense of loss for Jesus' followers. Just one week prior, they were celebrating their king and their Messiah as he rode his donkey over the cloaks and the palm branches that they had spread in the road. The men were singing, the women were crying, the children were shouting, and everyone was praising God for sending this prophet, this teacher, this Messiah, and their king. Their, finally, their long-awaited Messiah was here. Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus, the son of David, Jesus, the son of God, a man mighty in deed, mighty in word, a great prophet. Then, just a few days later, everything turned for the worst. It all went south, as they say. Joy became fear. Fear became the spear as the religious leaders incited the crowd to demand the execution of Jesus. Imagine how their hearts fell. The disciples were scattered. Jesus hung, Judas hung himself. Jesus' followers were intimidated. Peter denied even knowing him. Everything fell apart. They all watched as a, as a makeshift trial condemned Jesus and pressured Pilate into executing him. They saw him being nailed to a cross between two thieves. They watched him struggle for his last breath. They watched as his head fell and his chin came to rest on his chest and his body slumped forward as he yielded up the ghost they saw him taken down from the cross they saw him buried they saw the tomb sealed they saw a guard posted their hopes their dreams were dashed against the rocks smashed to bits their great hope their great deliverer was dead. Look at what's, what, what Cleopas says to Jesus in verse 31 of the scriptures we just now read. Verse 31. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Their great hope had died with Jesus. The hope of the redemption of, uh, of Israel had died. 
They were living in a hopeless world now. Their focus was on what their eyes could see. The mock trial, the sentencing, the crucifixion, the death, the burial. That's where it stopped. What went wrong? They wondered. Why did God not answer? Lord, you know we've been waiting for so long. This is what went wrong. This is the problem. They only heard what they wanted to hear. They had selective hearing. They only saw the Jesus that they had conjured up in their own minds. He had told them plainly that the Messiah, the, 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 the prophet, the, the, the one who was to come, the anointed one, he himself would have to suffer and even die. But no one took that seriously because that was not what they wanted, nor was it what they expected. That was not a part of their plan or their agenda or their vision. They did not want to hear that. They had shut their ears to the teaching and the promises of Jesus. And instead, they had their own expectation of who the Messiah was and what he would do and even how he would do it. But God is not bound by the limitations of our imaginations. He said this in Isaiah 55 verse 9. For as high as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. To put it another way, God is not limited to our um, limitations. God is limitless. The other problem is, we have let the world force us into believing that God's main priority is to make us happy and to keep us happy. If we're not happy, then it ain't God. Sorry to bust your bubble. But God is not overly concerned about your temporal happiness. He is more concerned with your eternal soul. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, word, not willing that any should perish, but that all, 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 all should come to repentance. The problem is we've taken our eyes off of Jesus and off of his promises. We no longer look forward to the receiving of his promises. We don't even take his promises serious. We no longer put our hope in heavenly things, eternal things, God things. I visited a church a few years back, and they had a visiting prophet. And at the end of the message, this is what the prophet told the church. I can't remember the message. I, I don't remember what the message was, was about. I don't remember the name of the visiting prophet. I only remember this. He said, we need to stop this preaching about Jesus' soon return. It is discouraging our young people. Instead, we should, give, we should be giving them something to hope in. This just blew my mind. I was like, what? Are you serious right now? It's like, excuse me, sir. I don't know what you want your kids to put their hope in. But as for me and my house, as for me and my family, we choose to hope in the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That is what the early church called the blessed hope. There was a time when Christians lived for the service to our king because they believed in the soon return of Christ and they wanted their service to count. Today, 
We see it as a stumbling block. How sad for the church. It leaves our young people hopeless. Today our prophets and our pastors want to advocate for earthly hope. We can't have our children hoping in some far off promise now, can we? That's, that just might take too much self-denial. It might cost a little more than we're willing to pay. Taking our eyes off of Jesus and his promises only serves to build weak Christians and a weak church and a weak bride. A, a, a church that Jesus called lukewarm. A problem comes along and the first thing we holler is this. Where was God? Well, God is right where you left him. Let me iterate one more time. God is not interested in your happiness. Does he want us happy? Yes, I'm sure he does. But that is not his priority. Neither does he go off uh, 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 or go out of his way in order to make us happy. What? Certainly that's blasphemy. But is it? Did Peter and John scream, where was Jesus when, we were, when they were beating us? No, they didn't. Look at what they did instead. Acts chapter 5, verse 40 through 42. And when they had called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Then they left the presence of the council. And watch this. Rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not seek teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus. They rejoiced that they were counted worthy to suffer for the name. They were, were, were counted honor. It was an honor to be beaten and to suffer dishonor for the name of Jesus. Someone looks at us wrong because we almost gave thanks over our food before we ate it. And we're all up in arms or disillusioned with Christianity. God is not for us. If he was, that wouldn't have happened then. Look at what Paul said, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17 through 18. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are not seen. For the things that are, are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. He starts off that verse, this light, momentary afflictions. Now I want you to realize this is a man who was always in prison, bound in chains, guarded by, by by um, Roman soldiers who was beaten with whips, who were beaten with rods, a man who was stoned and left for dead, a man who was shipwrecked trying to get the gospel out. Three times. Once he spent a day and a night in the open sea, not knowing whether he would survive or not. He didn't cry out, God, where, where were you? But instead, he called it light, momentary light afflictions. Did he take his eyes off of the eternal and set it on temporal? I say no. No way did Brother Paul take his eyes off of the, the, the eternal. Instead, look at what he said about the eternal or the blessed hope. The one that causes our young people to lose hope. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9 through 11. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, 
who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. He's saying, encourage each other. This is an encouragement. It's not a discouragement. This is an encouragement. We should all be looking forward to this. The soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is what we should be living for. Not hope in the world. He was encouraging his readers to look forward to the blessed hope, the return, the soon return of Jesus. The same thing the visiting prophet claimed was taking away the young people's hope. I want you to look with me at Stephen, Acts chapter 7, verse 58 through 60. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. As they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. The man whom Stephen was witnessing to dragged him outside the city and began to pelt rocks at him. Not close to him, at him. I'm sure he was trying to dodge a few of them. But a rock or two might hit him in the stomach and he tried to put his hands down to protect himself and another would hit him in his head. he hold his hand up. But the rocks were flying so hard at him that every time he tried to protect one part of his body with his hands, ten more would hit him somewhere else on, on, on another part of his body. Until he was full of blood. Until he was bleeding all over, bruised. His head popped open from rocks. He was bleeding so hard that in the loss of blood, he fell to his knees as still more stones Hit him. And what did he do? He cried out, Lord, where are you now? Why are you not coming to help me? No. No, he did not. No, he did not. What did he cry out then? Lord, save me? No. He cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. In other words, please forgive them. They know not what they do. He learned and understood from his, from his Savior, Jesus Christ, when Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. They had nailed him. They, they had beaten him first, beaten him beyond recognition. Then they nailed him to a cross. They spat upon him. Crowned him with, a, with, with thorns, a crown of thorns. And he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Was Stephen's eyes on the temporal? Was Jesus' eyes on the temporal? I say no. Their eyes was on the eternal. This world held nothing there for Stephen. This world held nothing there for Jesus. I wonder, have you all heard of a man by the name of Richard Warmbrand? Well, Pastor Richard Warmbrand is the founder of the voice of the martyrs. He spent 14 years in prison because of his unspoken Christian witness and his faith in Christ. Three of those years were spent in solitary confinement. He was brutally tortured, and when he lost consciousness or became too dazed to give his torturers any further hope of confession, they would return him to his cell, and there he would lie unattended and half dead until he regained enough strength for the torture to start 
all over again. His torturers broke four of his vertebrae and many of his bones. They carved in him dozens of places, burnt and cut 18 holes in his body. Apparently he couldn't even wear shoes anymore because his feet were so badly beaten. He went around barefoot. After he was ransomed out of communist Romania, the doctors in Nor Norway declared after seeing the scars on his body and the scars in his lungs from tuberculosis, said that according to their medical books, he should have been dead years ago. And the fact that he is still alive is nothing short of a miracle. His wife, Sabina, was also imprisoned for three years, including months in a labor camp on the Danube Canal. She was told that her husband was dead, that he had died in prison, which broke her heart. But through it all, neither of them gave up hope or wavered in their faith. Brother Paul asked a very good rhetorical question. This is a really good question. Romans chapter 8, verse 35. This is the question. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Let me ask you again. Who or what shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or even nakedness or danger or sword? What or who shall separate us from the love of Christ? So I want to ask you today, who or what is separating you from the love of Christ? Is it family? Or is it partying, having a good time? I, I'm, I'm going to do it, but I'm going to do it later. I'm having a good time right now. I'm young. I, I want to achieve some things first. Is it financial hardships that are separating you? Or is it climbing the corporate ladder that is keeping you separated from the, your Lord and Savior? Is it, fi uh, or is it personal gratification? Or is it TV? Do you just spend too much time watching TV? Or is it playing video games? Do you spend your day just playing Video games? As you get home from work, do you jump on a video game? Start playing video games? Do you, do you not go to church because you're busy playing video games? Or are you being separated for personal pleasure, personal entertainment? A little me time. Sunday, fun day. So I ask again, what is separating you? I'm here today to tell you that there's nothing in all of creation that is worth the separation. Absolutely nothing. There's nothing that this world can offer you that, that is worth you being separated from your Lord and Savior. I implore you to cast down your idols, get back to the basics, and seek your God. There's coming a time when we will no longer have religious freedom in our country. Public worship will be banned. Mark my words. The churches will be shut down. Your friends, even your own family, will be the ones who will turn you in. Even your pastor, the shepherd of the flock 
He might or she might even be the one to turn you in. I say, seek God while he is near. Learn to lean on him in the good times, that when the bad times or the hard times comes, you can look back as an example. You will have a track record. If you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, you can. You don't have to make an appointment. You don't have to wait weeks or even days until he's free. He's always just a prayer away. Trust him. Believe in him. He is coming back for us. So if you are interested in knowing this Jesus, if you're interested in knowing Jesus as Lord and Savior, it's easy as asking. Pray with me. Bow your head. Our Heavenly Father, I ask you to forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me of my lukewarmness. Help me to look forward to your soon return. Help me not to grow lukewarm or to be burnt out. But help me to grow hotter and hotter for you that I might not grow weary in doing good, that I might not grow weary of working for you, of telling the world about you, that I might not be discouraged in evangelizing. Thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for me. Thank you again for, for raising to life again, that I might have life. Be with me now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. I would suggest that you find yourself a church, a Bible-believing church. Join that church and be discipled in that church. Pay your tithes in that church and work. The, Lord, the return of the Lord is close at hand. It's real soon now. Buy, buy, buy yourself a Bible, a good Bible, and read that Bible every day. Get a highlighter. Highlight the verses that's meaningful to you. And pray. Remember to pray every day, twice a day, three times a day. Pray. It's really important. Get yourself a playlist with Christian music. Learn to worship. Learn to praise. Lord, learn to sing praises to your God. If you join us next week, we'll have part two of this message. And I want to say thank you for joining us this week. Thank you so much. I know there's other things that you could be doing, but you took the time to spend with us. Thank you. I'm Kenny Yates, and this is Hold to Hope. And again, thank you for joining us. I'll see you next week. Be blessed and stay blessed.